Tassa Bago Ato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Namo Tassa Bago Ato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Namo Tassa Bago Ato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Budang Damang Sangang Namasami Please have a seat. My foot's asleep, so you sitting down will help me stall for time. (laughs) Make sure they have uh, chairs, if that's all right. (laughs) In the, well, first you get a tag team experience today, Arjun Kovilo and I. We won't actually high five each other in, but (laughs) unless, yeah but we'll go back and forth. We just gave a retreat uh, called Paths to Well-Being uh, based on a book which Ajin Kovilo compiled during his time in college. And (laughs) that's right, you can clap. And uh, it's called The Well-Being Cascade. We have free copies in the back, uh, sponsored in large part by Rick and Ajin Kovilo's mother and this is just this beautiful compilation of every time in the canon where the Buddha speaks about this well-being cascade. So Freud, in his book, The Interpretation of Dreams, famously said, the best I can do is transform your neurotic misery into normal human unhappiness. (laughs) And one of the places Buddhism really is exemplary, is the Buddha's articulation of the path to and the vision of positive mental states. What does it look like to achieve a life and a heart of a level of purity and brightness and breadth and care that's super normal? Not just uh, normal human unhappiness, but truly transcendent uh, peace. And when he spoke about this path to Pomoja, this well-being cascade, one of the most famous places it appears is in the Connected Discourses, where first he lays out the shackle of suffering, uh, dependent origination, the 12 links of Paticca Sumupada, which is perhaps the most complex psychological system in Buddhism and a profound articulation of the genesis of suffering where our ignorance leads to mental formations, uh, leads step by step to craving, to becoming, to birth, to death, to old age, sickness, pain, grief, and despair. So that's a little bleak. So this Upanisa Sutta, this teaching, moves from this shackle of dependent origination of dukkha, suffering, dissatisfaction, stress. And then the Buddha says, dukkha is a prerequisite of faith, sada. Faith gives rise to pamoja, well-being. Pamoja serves as a requisite for piti, uh, refreshment or rapture. Piti serves as a requisite for pasadi, pasadi, tranquility of body and mind, which leads to sukha, ease, pleasure, happiness, which leads to samadhi, unification of mind and heart, which leads to vision of knowledge and visions of things as they are, which leads to dispassion, disenchantment, disenchantment, awakening. It's dependent, it's transcendent dependent origination. Just as clouds of rainwater would rain drops down on the top of the mountains and those drops would fill up the pools. The pools would fill up the small rivulets. The rivulets flow into streams, the streams to rivers, and the rivers into the great ocean. Even so, well-being gives rise to rapture, gives rise 
to tranquility, gives rise to happiness, gives rise to concentration, gives rise to knowledge and vision, and so on to liberation. In another sutta, the Buddha says, for one who is virtuous, no intention need be made, may non-regret arise in me. It is natural that for one who is virtuous, non-regret arises. For one in, who, in whom non-regret arises, no intention need be made. Uh, may well-being, pamoja, arise in me. It is natural. And so on through all those streams and rivulets of well-being down to this ocean. So when we think about approaching our practice in meditation and a Buddhist life, where's the joy in our religion? Where is the joy in this path? And to really make note of how the Buddha said that the bright mind was essential for the calm mind to manifest. How it's, like Long Pasna said, not so much always that our samadhi will come together and then we'll be happy, but rather our happiness comes together and then samadhi forms or manifests. And both have to be cultivated in tandem, but so often what we as practitioners in the West lack is the sense of play they have done fMRIs on the type of mind states that manifest with spotlight awareness, where you focus on one spot, versus lantern awareness, where you keep an open view of all that's coming through a moment. And what they found is that there's a third sort of awareness of play. And play awareness is a very good type of awareness and ethos to bring to the practice. How can we, in meditation, not just hammer away at one object that might feel dull or rote, but rather have a primary object like rice, say the breath, but then have a secondary, another object that is, serves to brighten and mix with the first, a bit like a recipe. So that secondary could be love, uh, metta, it could be the sound of silence, it could be the perception of light, it could be a recollection of giving, it could be faith. But finding a way to approach our meditation and Buddhist life in a joyful, engaged way and to initiate or seed those clouds that will usher into well-being. Yeah, so Ajahn Nisabo talking about that first, the first two steps. So when you have faith in a wholesome object or you practice generosity or keep precepts, you've got a good ethical foundation, that can give rise to well-being or pamoja. That's the kind of first pool at the top of the mountain. You've collected the rains from the clouds, and then that fills over. You cultivate that, pay attention to it, keep seeding the clouds, and then that eventually will well over into another pool, one of these other rivulets. And that next pool is, as Ajahn Nisibo said, it's piti, piti, which can be translated as joy, or rapture, or thrill, or zest, or refreshment. So you've got things you can choose from. Um, but it's good to learn some of these Pali words. So the word is PT. And one way which is helpful to remember that is you can just think of Mr. T. I pity the fool who doesn't know the joy of PT. And if you're too old to get that reference, don't worry about it. If you're too young to get that reference, you should look it up on TikTok. <laughs> but PT, PT, it comes from, uh, the etymology is not totally certain either. It comes from the root, which means uh, P, which means to refresh or to enjoy, or PA, which means to drink. So it's this thoroughly refreshing, uh, refreshing em emotion. And another name for this well-being cascade is the spiral path. And you can think about it whichever way you need to spiral, whether that's a spiral staircase going down to more and more bedrock, bedrock to a foundation, which is being able to find a, a totally solid and peaceful refuge in your life, or just a more and more exalted spiral path that just keeps going up and becomes more and more uh, exalted. And... PT, it works 
in both of these directions, up and down, and at different levels. You keep coming around. In your daily life, you start experiencing joy when you can trust yourself because you've got an ethical foundation. I'm not going to lie to anybody. That brings about a very mundane, worldly sense of, I feel good. I feel good about myself. I can trust me, and the people around me can trust me. And then it also bleeds in as you go up that staircase or down that staircase to the joy or the rapture of meditation. Um, this is one of the jhana factors, and it's one which the Buddha talks about in the discourse on mindfulness of breathing. I will breathe in, experiencing joy, experiencing piti, and it's something you can lean to. Um, the Buddha did say that all of these pools this whole well-being cascade, it's natural. It's a natural practice, a natural process. One needn't formulate the intention, may I experience well-being. It's natural and normal for someone who has faith in wholesome objects, for someone who has a sense of ethics or generosity, uh, has wisdom. It's just natural that you'll experience well-being. You don't need to put forth intention. But you can also seed and water these different pools further down the mountain and breathe in. I'll breathe in experiencing joy. I'll breathe in and out experiencing happiness. So this joy, this piti, see how you can lean into that or find, you know, like in a, I guess a simile of a, like a jacuzzi. Um, if you're sitting in a jacuzzi, there might be parts of the, if it's big enough, parts which are more or less the personally optimal temperature that you want. So you can just move over into that, into that area, the jacuzzi. Or similarly with the breath, you can breathe in and feel those parts of your body. Feel the, the whiffs and the aspects of the breath, which are just a little bit more joyous. Or just focusing on those aspects of mind, which bring about a lightness, as Ajahn Nisbo said, a brightness, uh, a sense of joy. So you can learn how to be better at joy. That's a good way of conceiving of the, the Buddhist path. We debated calling this talk Jacuzzi Dhamma, and then we decided to not call it that. <laughs> We're very restrained. Um, so, piti leads to uh, pasadi, which is tranquility of body and mind. When the Buddha talks or speaks about the progression through mindfulness of breathing, he starts with somewhat active uh, movements of expanding awareness to become sensitive to the whole body and then calming the bodily activity, that sensation of movement of energy in the body. And similarly, with the analogy he gives for the first jhana, which is a deep state of concentration, he speaks about a bath man kneads water into a ball of bath powder, powder so that no part of the ball is unpervaded with that water. Even so, a practitioner permeates and pervades with their body with the pleasure and rapture born of seclusion. So the hands of that uh, bath man are directed thought and evaluation. This is how we can be active at the beginning of a meditation and playful, bringing up perceptions of loving kindness, seeding those clouds, recollecting goodness, recollecting generosity. But then the Buddha moves to these qualities in that progression through mindfulness of breathing that really seem to have to do with a calming of the body. And so it's true that part of what we want to do is be bringing up wholesome and brightening states and perceptions. But then also, how do we calm down the body? How do we establish that sense of well-being and ease? And one really simple way to do this in meditation is to do a body scan, placing awareness in this upper chamber for a time while we breathe, perhaps imagining a bright white mist coming in and out, soaking into that. Then move down to the middle chamber, then the lower chamber, and then encompassing the whole body with this bright field of awareness, just imagining the sort of bright white mist of the breath kind of soaking in and out, paying special attention to 
soaking it into the shoulder blades and the kidneys. I know one teacher who said that his largest breakthrough in Anapanasati, mindfulness of breathing, was when he began to imagine the breath coming in through his shoulders. But also to note that when we feel a knot in the body, you can imagine the breath energy, and and this is just a perception, um, but you can imagine drawing down the breath through the head and having it move around the knot and erode it away softly, this sort of white light. Or you can imagine holding a canopy over that knot in the body and kind of expanding and contracting it, relaxing until it fades. One can bring to mind skillful means, um, you know, making sure one exercises before meditation or maybe takes a cold shower. Um, But the idea that there does come a point where really giving attention to pleasure in the body and relaxing the body becomes important. And that as one does that and focuses on relaxing the knots one might feel in the throat, in the forehead, etc., you untether each thought pattern in the mind will usually have a bodily correlate. And often that'll be a tension in the forehead or the jaw or the stomach. So when you gain a sensitivity to that to the body and begin to relax those knots before they've manifested into thought, one finds a way to hamstring thought and agitation before they have a chance to bubble up into actual articulation. And this can be a really powerful tool in meditation and how pasiti, uh, pasiti, tranquility of body and mind can further create this grounding for samadhi. The Buddha compares the cleaned mind to a cloth that has been thoroughly washed. And as long as our, the cloth is dirty and stained, then no matter what dye you soak it in, it'll appear marred. But once the cloth is beautiful and clean, then no matter what color you soak it in, whether you bring to mind a perception of loving kindness, of virtue, of Buddhanusati recollection of the Buddha, that color brightens the cloth into a new hue. And for one who has this quality of bodily tranquility, this kaya pasadi, as Ajahn Nisa was talking about, it's just natural. It's dhammata. It, you don't need to form an intention or make a wish May I experience happiness, dukkha. It's just natural for one who has a tranquil body that they'll experience happiness. And you can also experience it in that natural way, or you can lean into it. Uh, There's also that training, I will breathe in experiencing sukha, experiencing happiness, experiencing pleasure. I will breathe out experiencing happiness, experiencing pleasure. Um, This morning, uh, talk about other analogies never heard before. I was sitting in meditation and this kind of cool image uh, came to mind. You just imagine your inner sauna and going in there and you take a one single piece of uncooked spaghetti and you notice that there's a crack in the wall and you just stick it in there pointing out like this and then you just crank up the temperature to the exact right degree and that piece of dry, uncooked spaghetti will just gradually... I don't know if this has happened. I've never, I haven't looked it up on YouTube, but I'm imagining that that piece of dry and uncooked spaghetti, if you just get the right moisture content, the right heat content, then it'll just naturally relax. And that's kind of like, you know, it's a little bit a little bit different. Uh, probably not the best uh, analogy. But it, did, it helped me during the meditation just to, to relax. And you have to figure out your own controls. What is, what is the softness? The mudu is the Pali word. The softness that you can bring both to body and mind. And I, I think the practice of I will breathe in experiencing happiness or joy can actually be a little bit annoying for people who are just used to watching equanimously and saying, I'm not going to cultivate happiness. I'm not going to lean into the pleasurable, lean away from the unpleasant. I'm just going to be equanimous. It might seem, um, yeah, almost inappropriate to look for the, uh, that which is pleasant. But you can learn how to do this and figure out your own internal uh, knobs and gain skill in this, gain skill in learning how to uh, cultivate a pleasant sense. And if you can't do it with the body, you can do it with the mind. Even if the body seems totally 
rigid and dry and unpleasant. You can tune in to the softness of mind, tune into the pleasure of a mind that doesn't contend and just body and mind are like this, accepting that, and that's a softness which will uh, bring this level of sukha to the practice. The Buddha said in the Dhammapada that the whole path can be conceived of as a growing skill in happiness and pleasure. He said, if by abandoning a lesser happiness or a lesser pleasure, you gain a higher, a more refined, a more subtle, a better, a less harmful pleasure, happiness, then the wise person abandons that more coarse, more gross, the more harmful to self and others pleasure and cultivates the more subtle one. So it's not that the Buddha's path, the first noble truth is that there is dukkha, which is the opposite of sukha etymologically, and yet yeah, dukkha is suffering and sukha is, is happiness. That is the first noble truth. But finding this, this sukha, which is a jhana factor, a factor of uh, deep meditation, that's right samadhi, and that's what's gonna make our, our practice sustainable. And finding that on the level of mind, on the level of body, to the extent that you can, and believing that that's, that's possible is really helpful. And then that can take us to our next step. So after, uh, where are we? Suka. Thank you, thank you. After Suka. <laughs> After sukha and the spaghetti, um, I think we'll keep the analogy going. And you enter the tanning booth. You've left, left Mr. <laughs> you've left Mr. T behind at this point. The spaghetti's drooped to the floor in a soft way, but now it's time for tanning. And um, I think the only way this analogy actually works, and I kind of hope none of my teachers are watching this video, uh, is if um, we think about the quality of light, a quality of light. So samadhi means unification of mind. And the Buddha speaks about the concentrated mind as malleable, as bright, workable, like gold. And in the Anapanasati Sutta, the mindfulness of breathing, um, well, the analogies for the jhanas, actually, which sort of overlay this progression, they speak about that ball of path powder becoming permeated with this refreshing water. And then they speak about a cool mountain lake permeated with water. And then a pool of cool of lotuses, completely still, pervaded from their roots to their tips with cool water. And this is sukha. It's the sense of well-being that's completely still. It's like you, you brought to mind, say, loving kindness for a session, and suddenly you feel completely full of that. And when that happens, the fourth uh, analogy for jhana, which doesn't necessarily have to just resonate with someone who's actually attained the fourth jhana, but rather can be analogous to qualities of samadhi, where the Buddha says, just as a man draped from head to foot in a white sheet would have no part of his body untouched by that white sheet, uncovered, a pure white cloth, even so, a practitioner has no part of their awareness unpervaded by purity of mindfulness. And you'll notice the previous analogies have to do with this water soaking into the body. A lot of that practice is embodied. But when samadhi and the bright mind begin to manifest, often people will notice the consciousness will rise there's this sense of separation between the mind and the body, which is like the white sheet. This is how Long Parpasana has put it before. And there's a sense of brightness. So in the Anapanasati Sutta, the third uh, tetrad, steps uh, 9 through 12, say one becomes sensitive to the mind, one gladdens the mind, one concentrates the mind, and then one liberates the mind. So when the mind has become calm, when thoughts have subsided and these bodily knots have calmed and relaxed, one can really feel quite disoriented. You know, we orient ourselves by our suffering, by our mental landscape. And when those things have calmed, one can be left with sort of a blank nothingness that's kind of confusing. It's this blank cloth that we haven't encountered before. 
And then it's really important either to narrow in and really carefully track the breath at that one point where you feel it, like the tip of the nose, or widen out into that secondary object. Uh, put attention to the brightness of awareness or loving kindness and let the mind rest in that broad awareness like a water skipper on top of the surface of a pond. And feel free in that space of kind of that clean cloth to drop a perception of love or light and just watch it pervade out and gladden the mind. And when that happens, the mind becomes bright and then it will calm. That's when samadhi and unification of mind can manifest. That's when the bright cloth rises and covers the body. And it's, it's natural that for someone who has samadhi, whose mind knows stillness, it's just natural. You don't need to form a wish. May I see things as they truly are. Yata bhutanyana dasana. It's just natural that that'll happen. So we're coming down this, all these different pools coming down the mountain, heading in the direction of the great ocean of liberation. And the Buddha suggests that the next steps is, is just this, that when the mind is still, when you've got this level of samadhi, it's like you've stopped the table from, from shaking. Um, you can see things as they really are. This great image that Ajahn Chah gives of still flowing water. And this pool that we've come to now is so still, it's almost like a, an infinity pool. Um, and we're just immersed in there. And you look down and you can see to the bottom. You can see the coral at the bottom. You can see the shoals of fish just swimming along. And it's just perfectly clear, perfectly clear. And that's because we have a basis in this samadhi. And from that pool of knowing and seeing things as they are, we come to this level of disenchantment or nibida. Um, this is, yeah, some people don't like the uh, translation of disenchantment. It's like enchantment, that's what I want from my mystical or my spiritual life. Um, but what the Buddha is talking about here is, um, yeah, not being, not being fooled by our own misperceptions of things, but seeing things more clearly the way they are. And then from that, dis, uh, from disenchantment, nibida leads to viraga or dispassion, or just this letting go of the passion of greed and anger. And then from that, when you have that, when that pool, pool is filled, it just naturally fills in and flows out, just as rivers full of water entirely flow up, fill up the sea. Um, yeah, we rain down and we water and we seed the clouds of faith and generosity and keeping precepts and having integrity and cultivating wisdom, seeing the Four Noble Truths, and that will just naturally just keep filling up these pools and eventually lead out to the great sea, the great ocean of liberation. And that's great. The Buddha said that uh, Nibbana is the highest happiness. Uh, if you've read old translations from 1800s, early 1900s, and they translate Nibbana as extinction, and you think dinosaurs or uh, other things like that, it's, it's not at all like that. Nibbana is the, the highest happiness, the highest peace, freedom from greed, anger, and delusion, something which is everybody, if we had the eyes to see clearly enough, would, would want this foundational, fully grounded, yet utterly exalted and um, yeah, utterly normal level of peace and happiness. This is, you hear Arhants in Thailand talk about Mechi Gao, who is a, uh, a nun. Um, she talks about that the only normal people are the Arhants, people who've gotten rid of the biases of greed and anger from their own minds. Those are the only really normal people. All the rest of us are abnormal and weird. So... We can close the talk there and open things up for questions. Handamayang dhamma chakataya sadya karum dhamana se sadhu 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 anumodani.
So people can raise their hand in the audience or on Zoom, feel free to raise your electronic hand and we'll call on you. Thank you, Ajahn, for the talk. That was very nice to hear the tag team talk. <laughs> um, one thing that I wanted to know, what is your take on this question for Ajahn Kovilo? For Ajahn Chas, that statement is still flowing water. What, what do you, what is your take? How do I make sense of it? Thank you. Yeah, it's such a such a good question. Um, I mean, it comes up in a number of ways. He's someone comes up to him and they ask, "What is the mind of an arhat like?" And he asks, "Oh, have you seen still water? Like you look at some stagnant water, and you, yeah, of course, yeah, everybody's seen still water. Have you seen flowing water?" And you say, "Oh, yeah, I see a pond, see a stream or I see a river. It's flowing." But have you seen still flowing water? And yeah, what is that? Um, I did see a YouTube video a long time ago about this stream coming down out of a, a faucet, which it almost looked like it was a still life, but you could put your finger through it, and it actually was, it was moving, but it just looks still. And I think what he's pointing to is this, this balance between uh, insight, insight which can just know the movingness of the mind, know any of the movements of the mind, and with samadhi or samatha, tranquility, that which is totally still. So being able to be still even with flowing water. So that's one interpretation. Interestingly enough, and I haven't, I'm pretty sure that he got that, Ajahn Chah got it from Buddha Dasa's translation of the Sixth Patriarch. So Sixth Patriarch, it's a Mahayana Sutra uh, written in like the 6th, 7th century um, when talking about the mind which just knows things as they are. Um, Six Patriarch talks, Wei Ning talks about still flowing water, and you know, Buddha Dasa translates it into Thai, and then, so it, I thought that was quite interesting. Mind knowing mind, and a mind that knows mind, this third Satipatthana, can know the mind which is craving as a mind which has craving. Uh, it doesn't need the utter stillness that is absolutely free from craving to be able to see clearly. So balancing those. Yeah. John. Yeah. I, I just want to attest to the fact that when when I'm feeling happy, I have more samadhi. That that that's a true statement for me. That when I don't have a lot of remorse or any remorse, it's much easier to be still, to get still. So, I just wanted to say from my own experience, that's true. <laughs> Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you. I think we have a question on Zoom as well. Person on Zoom with the blue shirt and the blue couch. Um, can you hear me all right? Yes, please. Yeah, uh, it's a very great joy to be able to call in here from the UK. Um, it was lovely meeting you, Ajahn Nisabo, at Amaravati. I don't know whether you remember. Um, What's your you name? You're, you're very small Shirley. in the screen. My name's Shirley. Shirley, oh, good to see you, Shirley. Yeah, it's uh, just so good to be here. I've been following your talks um, on YouTube for quite a few couple of months now. And um, so it's a joy to be here. What I wanted to ask, and it's something that I've, I love these two suttas that you both talked about so beautifully. Um, it's um, this um, the the the, the, the um, oh the word's gone now the um this what you chant as disenchantment and the word's gone out of my N head nibida now. nibida, nibida. <laughs> yes it just went out of my head. <laughs> sometimes this I like the term disenchantment but sometimes it's described as a turning away or even a revulsion from the world which really doesn't sit comfortably with me it smacks of some sort of aversion some sort of 
but am I missing something? I mean, I. How do you feel about this translation revulsion or or turning away? Um, because I feel. I feel a sense that the Dharma should open us up to life rather than cut us off from life, but we're not sort of sucked in in a sort of enchanted way, thinking because, I mean, I am, I can see that I am. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I get seduced and enchanted by uh, the uh, ephemera of life um, because I don't see clearly. And I, this is why I like the term disillusion or disenchantment. But am I missing something by recalling from the translations of um, revulsion and turning away? I'd really appreciate your reflections. No, thank you, Shirley. Um, I think Bhikkhu Bodhi, for one iteration of one of his translations, or maybe a few, did use the word turning away or revulsion because the root is a turning, right, of Nibida? Yeah, feeling knit in a way. Um, but I know he later said that he regretted that translation because of this exact valence you're speaking of, where it implies repulsion or revulsion or, uh, you know, we bhava tanha, desire not to be. And I think um, one analogy Ajahn Jayasaro gives is it's not that where these, you know, the Buddha compares the mind to a monkey often, and it's not that as a monkey we've become tired of a new, of yet another object or of all the objects in front of us. It's rather we're just tired of being a monkey. And um, I really like that. Uh, but the sense, I think disenchantment's so good because the Buddha does compare consciousness to a magician at a crossroads. And it's just the sense of seeing through the trick and I think so many of these terms are usefully pointed to in the word samvega, which is impossible to translate, but it is this movement of the heart that manifests, and Ajahn Jeff uh, describes three qualities in tandem with it, which is an alienation from the world we formerly bought into, a um, sense of chastisement over our own foolishness, and a sense of urgency over the practice. And I like those three, except they miss I think for me, the sense that it's not just urgency, but also a sense of hope and brightening and a path. You know, it's not just Plato's prisoner suddenly realizing he's been watching shadows on the p cave wall. You know, if they just lower your eyes, that's just depression. And I think sometimes depression has a seed of wisdom in it for that reason. But it's also the prisoner turning their face to this bright tunnel behind them, beginning to intuit light and sun. And for me, uh, Vira, or, um, Samvega has this quality of yes, you've seen through the world and it's just the disenchantment of a child no, long, no longer wanting to play with, with their toys anymore. There's something more. But there's also the sense of a deep self-worth and a nobility in life where you know you're worth more than this. You know, you, you know that your life is worth more than going to another Marvel movie. And and there's a sense of genuine hope and uh, path. So I, I think, yeah, I think you're pointing to that aspect of revulsion and having a reaction to that's probably, probably something shared by many. Um, and I think the disenchantment translation is good for that reason. Uh, it looks, speaking about looking over these things rather than turning away necessarily. Ajahn? Just on that, that theme of disenchantment versus revulsion, and as you said, you know, just like a, you look back on the things that you loved when you were a kid, and it's just like you don't want those things anymore. It's just totally natural. You're not pushing them away. It's just you've kind of grown up um, on the theme of watery uh, illusions, uh, illusions. I remember when I was 11, I had this wish that when I'm older, I'm going to be so rich that I have a swimming pool full of jello. <laughs> and it's like, now? Not at all. That would just be <laughs> gross. So, yeah, you just kind of grow up out of these things. So. Thank you, Ajans. It's so nice to see both of you here. Um, 
you mentioned play Janisebo and this uh, the MRIs you were talking about is there's an object of one pointedness and an object that was more expansive and there's this object of play that they discovered and I wonder if you could say more about what is the object of play when looking uh, as a meditation object? Thank you. I think the research was done by Alice Gopnik. Uh, she wrote The Philosophical Baby and is a specialist in psychology with infants. And um, these two sorts of awareness are really distinguishable where spotlight is focus on one object, somewhat spatial, I think, or one word. And the other is lantern awareness, where it's temporally focused, which means you have a wide awareness in the moment, and everything that passes through that moment is accepted um, and known. And I find that these are the extremes that Western meditation instruction swings to. Either you're told one object, or you're told accept everything that comes through. And it's not that there's an object of play, but it's the ethic of play. And I think a really good analogy is when you play a violin, you have the bow, which is this long, kind of smooth, broad awareness, but then you also have the fingers kind of dancing up and down the fingerboard. It's, it bounces back and forth. And that is just different in the mind in the sense like you're engaged with the object, there's interest, you're testing its limits. It's a much different way of interacting with the world. And I think it, it's much more um, sustainable and joyful. And also for many of us, more rewarding. I mean, Ajahn Jeff says, you don't learn about eggs by staring at an egg. You make an omelet, you make a fried egg, you make a quiche, you know, you experiment with the mind. And why I bring it up in that context is sometimes if you only have one object of meditation, just a one word or one place that you focus the breath, it's, there's not much you can play with. It's like a block of wood, you know? Um, whereas if you have two objects, a secondary and a primary, or the breath and some sort of brightening thing, there's enough room to mix and match and play a bit. And I think that's when you really can make uh, meditation more enjoyable and sustainable. So that makes sense. Thank you. We have time for one more, and then we're going to have to wrap up a little early. A little more basic and uh, novice targeted question. Um, the Buddhist tradition seems structured a bit differently than the Western ones, which are very narrative driven and not in a con no, no connotations there, but like a uh, you're back in middle school English class. You're going to read the text and you're going to anal analyze it and then you're going to try to extract things from it. Whereas these talks seem a little more direct. There are still metaphors, but you're almost working with proverbs there. And I was just curious, is that an accurate perception of the tradition holistically? And then given that there's such a corpus of text, do you have any particular things you recommend people read just to get that foundation that you're unlikely to have naturally picked up from the culture growing up so far away from it? It's a great question. Um, Ajahn Jayasaro, who was with us about a month ago, he talks about the Abrahamic religions as uh, being faith-based religions, or as you said, like the narrative-based. You've got basically the fundamental principle is you have faith or, or you don't, or there are people who have, you have faith or you don't, and that's the foundation, whereas Buddhism is like an education system, or as you said, basically more, more practical, and that's definitely the Buddha's orientation. Uh, he gives this simile uh, after he was enlightened. He's in this forest with these tiny sal, S-A-L, um, tree. It's a sal tree forest, which has these little tiny leaves. He picks up this handful of, of leaves, and he says, which is more? He's talking to all the monks. Which is more, the leaves in my hand or the leaves in all the forest? And the monks kind of like, well, it's the, the leaves in the forest are more. The leaves in your hand are less. He says, in the same way, what I realized on my night of enlightenment is akin to the whole forest. But what I teach is just the Four Noble Truths. Why is that? Because it leads to the end of suffering. I only teach one thing, and then he says two things. I only teach one thing, suffering and the end of suffering. So 
yeah, it's, it's, a very practical, it's a very practical teaching. And the forest is just vast. There's animals crawling around, and you've got bunches of leaves, but he's just teaching the things that lead to the end of suffering. So, um, yeah, pretty practical. Yeah, but great question. Yeah. Yeah, I think that the handful of leaves analogy is so important. And, um, th I mean, this is where Buddhism is, is kind of astounding, is the deeper you go into those 45 years of the Buddhist teaching, the more you realize he just left us with such a wealth. And yet, it's not haphazard or complicated in the sense like it has this profound internal integrity and cohesion. It's like a crystal. So some of the suttas I was mentioning, one of the reasons you can jump back and forth and why sutta-based teachings are so rich is the suttas are, are hyperlinked at a way like it's hard to understand unless you dove, dove in, dived, help, <laughs> dove, dove in deep. So the mindfulness of breathing sutta is overlaid almost perfectly by the four foundations of mindfulness, is overlaid almost perfectly by the seven factors of awakening, is overlaid almost perfectly by the four jhanas, it's overlaid almost perfectly by the analogies for the four jhanas. It's profound. And um, so it's complex, but it's also very simple. And, and the Four Noble Truths encompass it all. And a really good way to start diving in is first subscribe to a newsletter called the Daily Sutta. Just type in Daily Sutta Newsletter. We know the monk that curates that. Uh, the Noble Eightfold Path by Bhikkhu Bodhi is a very small book deals dealing with the Noble Eightfold Path. And then we have a bunch of free books in the back that just take, take as many as you can carry within reason. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's an amazing landscape the Buddha left us with, so. Okay. So um, just quickly, I think we will read the chanting request uh, list now. And for those who don't know, this is just a um, list of on our website under support, chanting requests of people who we want to keep in our hearts. Um, so can we read that? 